Folks, I'm Woody, and welcome back to the shed, the home of the Moss Trooper and the Burning Flying Circus. And we haven't been doing very much of that for a while. In fact, the Moss Trooper hasn't had air under the wheels more than a dozen times since mid-November last year, nearly three months. It's been wet, windy, or both for all that time, which is frustrating. And this can lead to getting airborne with a forecast that's less than ideal. While I was shooting the video for the turn back sequences, the wind back at the field picked up much more than was forecast, and by the time I made it home it was becoming very bumpy at low level. The last 200 feet of the approach were quite exciting, and I recall thinking something like, Rhino mate, time to pay some frickin' attention here, as the speed and the nose went in the same direction three times in as many seconds. And finally, having turned right to clear the runway, the aircraft just wouldn't turn any further because of the wind on the fin. I had to do a 270 degree turn the other way instead, followed by a very careful taxi back. Now, if that had been on tarmac, it would have been a very different story, and probably much more exciting. So, moving on, I'm going to look at the situation that maybe represents the worst thing that can happen to the pilot of any aircraft, and that's an engine failure shortly after takeoff. The standard teaching for this emergency event has been, at least in my experience, to pick a flat spot within 45 or sometimes 30 degrees of the nose, and hope to walk away from the landing or crash, whichever it turns out to be. It's always been emphasised to me that we should never attempt to turn back to the runway because this is likely to be the result. Or this. Or this. More recently I've noticed that the thinking might be changing. In the USA it seems to have been as a result of this fatal accident last year small plane crash in the middle of a Florida neighborhood. We do want to warn you, the video you're about to see may be disturbing for some viewers. Oh, wow. At least two people were killed in this crash Monday afternoon in Pembroke Pines. Again, this is in Florida. Now, I know this is a very controversial topic, and I've read some pretty strong arguments for and against what people call the impossible turn. Some believe that it should never even be discussed, let alone attempted, in case it gives pilots encouragement to try it, when they will surely die. Perhaps part of the reason for this dogmatic view is that, after an engine failure at this point in a departure, the instinct to turn back is very strong, so it must be erased from our thinking. I take the view of some instructors, and I must emphasize here I'm not an instructor, I'm just speaking for myself here, that some aircraft which suffer this kind of failure can be safely returned to the runway by some pilots under some conditions. So I ask the question, is the mini sport one of these, followed by, flown by me under the conditions that I normally have to cope with? I've tried to find out based on the three priority actions, aviate, navigate, communicate. Fly the aircraft, stay in control. Steer the aircraft to a safe area and tell the world what's happening. I began by doing a lot of reading to find out why the manoeuvre is considered to be so dangerous as to be discounted as an option by so many experienced pilots. In the past two years, I've personally suffered three engine failures, one of which was under the conditions we're talking about here, which was not in the Mini Sport, but a Rans S6. I and the other occupant walked away from a slightly bent aeroplane, having lost the engine at 180 feet in the climb out at just over 50 miles an hour. We did a turn back through 270 degrees and made a landing on the only bit of level ground that wasn't obstructed by buildings, wires, fences, trees, rocks, streams or animals. It was a pity that it was also a bog. This had the effect of shortening the landing roll quite a bit, obviously, but at the cost of a bent undercarriage. So, the not impossible turn perhaps. I think we owe the fairly successful outcome to having briefed the possibility before takeoff and what I'd do if it happened. That it was a test flight after some work on the fuel system offered a good reason to think about the what ifs, so we were already mentally prepared for it. This was a standard procedure in my former life in military aviation, so it's become second nature to at least remind myself of the plan or, or make one for the conditions of the day before letting the brakes off. 
If being prepared, as the Boy Scouts say, is a secret, how do we achieve that? The obvious answer is to go up and try it. Find out what we can get away with, make a plan, and then practice it. I decided to try to fly an accurate balanced turn at 45 degrees of bank, engine the idle at the aircraft's best glide speed. Do that through 360 degrees and see how much height I used to do it. This would give me a starting point for my personal turn back decision. I decided to enter the turn back from my usual climb attitude and airspeed with takeoff flap selected. That would be the normal condition that I would be in at that stage. Then close the throttle, count to three, then lower the nose. As I push the stick forward, I'd apply full aft trim, raise the flap, then start a 45 degree turn while trying to capture 59 knots with just enough bottom rudder to balance the turn. We'll look at the results in a second, but it's worth saying right now that the early attempts were a bit of a shambles, enough to say that the airspeed wasn't stable, the skid ball was all over the place, and the angle of bank varied between 30 and 60 degrees. But, as we do, I improve with practice. So, here's the drill. Climbing at 55 knots with full power. Car feet on, then as we pass 2,000 feet I close the throttle count to three to simulate the I don't believe this is happening to me reaction. Lower the nose while raising the flap and selecting trim to fully back nose up. Setting full nose up trim I'd already found out would give me a 55 knot glide unless I interfered with it, which is close enough to 59 for me, particularly as it removes one major concern and that's stalling in the turn. At 45 degrees of bank, the clean stall speed of the Moss Trooper, 42 knots, needs to be increased by 20% to 50 knots. So, with the speeds I calculated, I have a 10% stall margin without having to get too distracted by speed control. It's not great, but this is an emergency procedure, right? Why a 360 degree turn? Well, if we all flew from 100 acre fields, maybe a 180 would be enough. But if we have to return to a runway or grass strip, then the pure turnaround just puts us pointing parallel with the line we use for takeoff. To land back on the same bit of turf requires a bit more turning, so by making it a 360 turn, I'm built in that factor, plus a bit more for safety probably. What that adds up to, I believe, is a worst case scenario for a turn back in a mini sport with a takeoff weight of 225 kilos. The results of the test show that I can safely make it around the 360 spiral with a height loss of 300 feet under the conditions of the day. I can reliably achieve a 180 degree turn with less than a 200 foot height loss. Now, there's some debate as to whether the idling engine provides some thrust. Some say it produces more drag, a hindrance more than help. So maybe I'll try it on a calm day and do a mags off dead stick turn back procedure overhead the field. Maybe on a really good day, when it's quiet. Okay, so we've established that I, as a non-instructor, and I think a fairly average mini-sport pilot, needs 300 feet under my backside to carry out a safe turn back onto a runway where there are no other landing options. Possibly downwind. All other things being equal, which of course they probably won't be on the day, but this is the best I can do for the moment. There will be other factors in play, and these will be different depending on where you fly from, the weather, the traffic, etc, etc. So the rest of my invest investigations will centre on operating from my home field. They may not apply to anywhere else, but might serve as a kind of checklist for things to bear in mind if you feel you want to plan ahead. Right then, this is my home field. It's a grass strip orientated east-west, a bit undulating and about a thousand metres long, and at best a hundred metres wide. It has a lot of trees immediately north of the runway towards the western end, and north, northwest, and northeast of those are small holdings, houses, and other areas unsuitable for landing. North of the eastern end are trees and the hangars. 
To the south of the runway, there are small fields divided by tree lines and hedgerows all along the southern side of the landing area. What are my options here then? Straight ahead, or nearly so? Rising ground, small fields, power line, water and woodland, not to mention the domestic stuff. Not ideal. The area to the left, the north, has a large field, which although it sometimes has sheep in it, would be a workable option. Further turning puts me in the vicinity of the trees with only small fields beyond, so that's a limit, a 90 degree turn to the left. As a domestic power line running along the hedgerow on the approach, which needs to be borne in mind, it's not very easy to see. To the right, there are more options, and even though the ground is undulating and steep in places, I'll accept those hazards under the circumstances. In essence, I think I could turn up to 90 degrees to the left and probably a 270 to the right to reach a comfortable landing area. Since the wind at Easterton is more likely to have a southerly component, for the sake of constancy, I plan to turn right by default. Options are fewer at this end. I took this video with a low sun to emphasise, I hope, the trees and the pronounced slope of the ground to the south and the height of the trees to the north. Straight ahead plus or minus 30. If I can clear the trees and rough ground immediately beyond the threshold, this might be a plan. The field beyond is more steeply sloping than the video shows, but it is grass. Unfortunately, it's also generally full of red deer being raised for the butcher, and they are pretty effective obstacles. If I see on the way to the airfield that the field is empty of deer, I might include the option in my pre-takeoff thinking. The field to the left is generally in crop, but I forced landed there before, so I know it could work even though I might flip over. The right turn towards the north really isn't an option. There's a village, small farms, small fields, livestock and trees. Even if I had the height to point back along the parallel and then attack the runway, I'd have to be able to clear the very tall trees to the north of the strip or manoeuvre hard to avoid them. This would represent a massive temptation to stretch the glide and I mustn't get that into my mind as a possibility. If I chicken out and try to land to the north of the trees, well, the fields just aren't big enough. I'd get away with it, but I'd probably wreck the aeroplane, if not myself as well. So, we're back to the left turn option. I had the height to choose from several landing areas here. Even if I can't make the airfield, the downward sloping fields and what would be my approach are clearer obstructions other than the trees on the boundaries. If I can get down quickly, having crossed these, then good. But I might have a healthy tailwind, which, combined with a downslope, create a very strong visual illusion of flying too fast. I don't want to expose myself to the chance that this might catch me out, so I believe that a 270 turn onto north, accepting the crosswind, might be the safest plan. Everything up to now has been straightforward, and I don't want to confuse the issue too much. As I said earlier, this plan depends on the external factors remaining the same, and inevitably, as a soldier we say, no plan survives contact with reality. So, what factors might change that plan? Firstly, the wind. A strong headwind on takeoff would mean that I'm a lot closer to the runway at the decision point. There may not be enough runway behind me to make a safe turn back, so this might be a day to consider the 90 left or right option if it's available. I certainly wouldn't want a dead stick fast downwind landing by choice. Secondly, the wind but this time a strong crosswind, which for me is 10 knots. That would normally have a bearing on which way I should turn, but here I'll ignore it for the other benefits. Thirdly, other traffic. If there's a glider on a winch launch behind me, it would be a significant hazard. Unfortunately, I can't rely on the radio to either inform me of what's going on after I take an off, nor for me to warn the glider brethren of my intentions. That's if I turn back. In fact, I can't even guarantee that a mayday call would provoke any kind of response. So the communicate part of the three priorities will stay where it is, at the bottom of the stack. Fourthly, obstructions on the landing areas. These might include the deer mentioned before, tall standing crop, ploughed earth, livestock fencing or gliders. All of these would need to be acknowledged, even if they could be accepted as a risk. Hitting a red deer stag would be as catastrophic as hitting the brick wall, and flying through a launch cable would be fatal. 
And fifth and lastly, how might the plan change for different airfields? Since I won't necessarily be aware of the landing options everywhere, it would be good to have a standard plan that would work at most airfields. So here's my Afato engine failure after takeoff briefing to myself. As I reach the holding point on runway 26 with a 10 knot headwind. This will be an interwind takeoff using takeoff flap. The initial climb will be at 55 knots until 200 feet. When the engine fails, I'll retract the flap while turning left to find a safe landing area. If the engine is still working at 200 feet, I will retract the flap and convert to a 60 knot best rate climb. When the engine fails at 300 feet, if there is no safe area ahead, I can turn left to achieve a landing on the airfield, but if the engine is still running, I will switch off the fuel pump and continue the flight. And concurrent action. When the engine fails, I will select a positive nose down attitude, retract the flap and trim fully aft. At stick forward, flap forward, trim back. Subsequent action will be commence a turn using 45 degrees of bank with gentle rudder and not below 55 knots and aiming for 59. Make a radio call, mayday, 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 golf mic, whiskey, engine failure, turning back. And then I might select the flap as required to assist a safe landing when I'm sure that it won't compromise the approach. Oh, right. As I said, this is my action plan in this aircraft at this airfield, which will only be modified by the takeoff direction and the wind conditions. If there's a crosswind, I'll not be using flap for takeoff and only for landing if I need to slow down a lot because of a tailwind or if there's not much runway left. I realise that this doesn't cover all the possible scenarios, but it's good enough for most and importantly, it allows me to practice a one size fits all drill, which will hopefully install some muscle memory of the vital actions. If the desire to turn back is, a, is as instinctive as I think it is, I'd rather have some instinctive actions to help me achieve it. If, after commencing the action, it's obvious it's not going to work, then I've lost nothing. The aircraft's still flying, and I've eliminated some of the dithering about what to do. Like I pointed out at the start of all this, I'm not an instructor. So these are just my opinions and a plan that might work for me. If you disagree, that's fine. I expect there will be some brickbats to dodge, but I'm open to suggestions and thank you for watching. Roll on summer. Bye bye.